So thank you for inviting us. And uh, my name is Liran Eshel. I'm founder and CEO of Citera. So who is Citera? What are we about? So Citera is about your files, your cloud. What, what it means is that we provide multi-cloud enterprise unstructured data management um, that allows organizations to connect remote sites, remote users to any cloud of their choice without compromising security or performance. We started this company in 2008, myself and a group of other people, some of them are speaking to you today, um, after, many years, after many years in the cybersecurity space. We lived through the transformation of enterprise networking from leased lines to broadband. Okay? And what made it possible were technologies such as firewalls, VPNs, uh, that bridge the security and performance gaps. Our vision, you know, when we started the company, cloud was not a household name in enterprise IT. Um, but our vision was that it's inevitable that that's a direction that IT will go to. But in order to make it possible, there are certain technologies that have to be in place in order for storage to bridge the gap towards cloud and public infrastructure. I'm happy to say that today, rolling into current time, we have more than 50,000 locations connected with our edge filers. This is by far the, the largest number in the industry um, in more than 110 countries, millions of endpoint users using Citera they, on a daily basis to access their corporate files in a secure way. And we're serving more than 50 global Fortune 500 companies, top banks, insurance company, media, telecom, and uh, very strategic uh, government uh, federal agencies. You can see some of our customers here, uh, like General Electric, McDonald's, WPP, Orange, um, Navy, Air Force. Uh, but you're going to hear more about customers uh, from Jim later on after me. What is our vision? For the, for the infra, infra, enterprise infrastructure. Our vision is infrastructure everywhere, okay? In our view, every IT environment needs to be hybrid. We see much more uh, demand for data generated at the edge. We think that storage should not limit workload placement. So if workload needs to sit in the edge, storage should make it possible and that storage needs to be instrumented and accessible anywhere. We divide our world to three buckets. Cloud, which are the public cloud providers. Core, which is the enterprise data centers. And edge, which are typically remote locations and up to what we call the far edge, which is home offices and IoT devices. We have all witnessed the shift from core to cloud in recent years. But what we see coming in the coming years, and this, this is a customer survey that Gardner did not so long ago, is that there's gonna be a stronger push in the coming years also to edge, that we have not really seen most of it until now. The data here is staggering, but even half of that, even if half of that is true, then we're gonna see much more the edge and that's driven by autonomous cars and by 5G towers and by video surveillance and many, many type of use cases that are driving additional data and workload placement at the edge. But edge is hard. You know, storage for years has been mostly designed to sit in the core data center of the enterprise. You have amazing systems, high performance. I'm sure you've heard many presentations in the last years about the amazing storage system. I would guess more than 90% of them were for storage that sits in the corporate data center. But once you go away, you distance yourself, you know, 100 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers uh, from uh, the headquarters, the experience is much different. You go to regional branches, you see uh, disconnected storage systems, you have performance issues over latency, you're running out of disk space, backup is becoming much more challenging, and IT availability is much more limited. You take it to what we call the far edge, the home, it's a total nightmare, right? Yeah, you are very limited in what you can access, things are running very, very slow and basically no IT. 
So what is our vision? Our vision is that file storage at the enterprise needs to be available in a distributed fashion in every location, regardless of location. At the core, at the edge, and the fire edge, you should have the same headquarters grade experience. In our view, the master copy of the data is no longer sitting in the core or at the edge, it's sitting in the cloud. It's cloud-centric, the, the master copy of the data is in the cloud, and in each location, you basically get a cached version of the files that you need to access on any given time. At the core, these would be larger filers because you have more data need to be served there and more users. That's very reasonable. You move to the edge, you'll have smaller systems. And at the far edge, you're not going to even have, even have filers. You're going to have endpoint clients that sit on those desktop devices, inside IoT devices, and but they're all accessing to the cloud. They don't go through the edge or through the core. Everyone is accessing directly towards the cloud, and the cloud is basically available everywhere. All of that is in one global namespace, which means that you can share data between each of the sites. There's global dedupe across this entire namespace. So you have amazing cost saving. You never run out of space. It's totally elastic. And, and by configuring the, the right cache size to the right site size, you basically get the experience of having local storage on your network. So that if you want, if you say that's our vision of how to solve the infrastructure everywhere a vision, a challenge or a goal that we want to achieve in the enterprise IT. And how do we do that? The core of our technology, the, the, the core building block of our technology is our file system. It's a multi-cloud global file system that we have developed that rides over public infra, over infrastructure that's made of 97% object and 3% flash. Basically, most of the data goes into object storage and we support almost any object storage provider today, public or private. And 3%, we need block storage for the metadata. But if you give us that, 90% object, 3% flash, basically we can build for you any storage uh, deployment uh, across any geography, any topology. Our file system is software defined. You can run it in any, any environment. It's using the global dedupe. It has source space encryption which means that when we store blocks in the infrastructure, these are encrypted blocks. And the keys are sitting with the file system and you can disconnect them. They don't need to be in the same infrastructure. So it's almost like a VPN for storage. If someone accidentally gains access to your storage bucket, they cannot undedupe or decrypt the data because the keys are not there. The file system is POSIX compliant and supports also NTACLs. What it means is that you can take existing folder shares on the corporate network and move them as is into this file system. You don't need to flatten them. You don't need to reduce permissions. You can just move it as is and you can maintain the entire data and metadata. And on top of the file system, we, get, we have access devices, so access solutions, starting with what we call the edge filer, which provides SMB NFS access with the caching, and gives a NAS-like experience, NAS experience. We have the endpoints, which are desktop and mobile applications that sit on the desktop uh, or also on a VDI and give you access directly from the operating system. And we have also, now we're releasing this year also the container solution that will basically give access to the file system directly mounted inside a Kubernetes node using CSI driver. Um, more zoom in into the architecture and our CTO is later going to provide you even further zoom in into the technology. Uh, but this is- Hey, hey Loran, um, yes. this is Ray Lucchese. Uh, Hi, Ray. Does the system support global locking? So if I am you know, sitting at home and I want to ex update a file does that file get locked across uh, the global namespace? That's a great question. And actually, uh, so the, the quick answer is that we do eventually consistent with the conflict res resolution mechanism. 
and uh, we also do site level locking. And actually, Aaron, our CTO, will go into much more detail on this on this specific topic in his presentation. So maybe I suggest that we defer it, and he's going to address that. Okay. Any other question? Is the files um, are they split across objects, or are they effectively one to one mapped to an object? Okay. So we are, it, they're they're split in objects, meaning that we, file does not equal an object. Basically, file is a split into multiple objects, which means that we have unlimited file size. And we can also do DDoP, DDoP on a sub-file level, on a block level. And the third question is the data protection uh, in the object space. Is that based on the object storage itself, or do you provide some sort of erasure code rating kinds of capabilities? Um, we, so Aaron is going to go into that more in his uh, presentation. Uh, we use the object layer the built-in mechanism of the object layers, but we also have inside the file system uh, snapshots and the other mechanism inside on the file level. I guess, okay, thanks. Okay, so let's now take a deeper look into the architecture. The first thing you're gonna notice here is that we have what we call a two-tier architecture. Okay. And that's, you can see it by the separation from edge and drive to the portal. So what is this portal? This portal is basically a middleware that runs the global file system and has the multi-tenant management for the entire deployment. It connects to S3 buckets, private or public, and also to external security and data management tools like virus scanning, DevOps, data insight, visualization, and uh, active directory, active AD authentication. The clients, the access, the access gateways or clients are separated from that. So between the edge and the portal, typically there is latency, there is a network. Okay. And you can distance them as much as you want. The edge is the entity that basically provides the SMB and FS access. You can connect any network, home folders, VDI workspaces to that. It performs the ca caching, so it keeps the hot data locally, does eviction of unused data, and also the multi-site multi multi synchronization and the archiving. By doing this two-tier architecture, we can keep our edge client, clients much lighter, and we can really support a network of any size. So we can do thousands of sites. Another, another thing we can do is basically we can connect also the edge endpoint clients, what we call here Citera Drive and Citera App, which is a sync and share and cache drive application, very similar to, let's say, OneDrive or, or backup endpoint backup solution. But the, the difference is that they are on the same namespace and they can access the same shares with the POSIX and the NTACLs, and we would enforce these permissions. And you can access the same data from the drive as well as from the filer at the same time. Um, we support any of the you know, leading operating systems, obviously Microsoft, the Windows, Mac OS, uh, Linux, uh, and also the, the Android and the iOS applications. So the nice thing about our solution is that we, it's basically a platform that can serve, serve multiple use cases. Some customers buy it for just one use case, data expand to others, and some, some of them from day one use it for multiple use cases. Here are some of the uh, top use cases that, that typically are being used by customers, and I'm gonna review each of them to give you more insight on how the product is being used. Let's start with the basic functionality, NAS replacement, NAS modernization. Customer has a site, the site has a NAS system, maybe it's running out of space, maybe the customer is looking to use cloud, cloud technology, maybe, uh, maybe it's too expensive, maybe it's too slow. How, how, how do we address it with Citera? So instead, let's say you had a hundred terabyte uh, NAS on site, you basically, all you need is a cache, caching device, edge filer with let's say 20% of the size, 20 terabyte, you place it on the site, you migrate the data to the system, the, the data is replicated to the cloud, and you can start serving SMB NFS users on the network with the same folder structure that they had before. The system has automatically doing the deduplication, and, the, the, and so typically you'd see anywhere from 60 to 80% um, 
uh, reduction in data set. So, so Loren, um, can, can you support, you know, I don't know if it, what would be called multi-cloud access for the object storage. So use, let's say AWS and Azure to host your files and, and are they replicated between those two points? Or are they segregated? Yes. Uh, I'm trying to understand how that works. You can, you can basically connect multiple storage buckets to the system and the system would load balance basically would use both of them. But they're not, you're not necessarily replicating across those buckets, the data. They're not necessarily replicating. There are other solutions, by the way, that you can configure a replication on the object level. But we allow you to use multiple concurrent object systems. And we also give you the capabilities to migrate data between storage buckets. So if you stop using one of them, you can either mute it, or you can also migrate it to another bucket. Yeah, and you I mentioned that the data is... I'm sorry, I mentioned that the data is encrypted at the edge and the keys are like maintained at the edge. Is that the true? Keys are maintained. There's, if, if I go back to the architecture, there's this, the portal and there's the edge clients. Okay. And the portal is running in the cloud and the edge clients are running out in the edge. The portal can also run in the core. So it's not necessarily has to be in Amazon when using Amazon Bucket. You can run the portal in your data center, you can run it in Amazon. And the keys are sitting in the Citera portal. Oh, I see. Then just to chime in, chime in, effectively, the portal acts as, as the key management server. If of any situation you lose a filer, then the portal can then send that key back to a filer that we then rebuild. Um, but then also the portal can connect to an external key management solution uh, if we want to offload those keys to an external key manager. Um, with this type of architecture, you can keep the portal on-prem or choose to host it in your VPC, but effectively you're the one that's in control of the encryption keys and they're kept separate from, from the data set itself. And then to go back just to, to the previous point around the storage connectivity, we can support about 36 different types of providers today, um, Amazon, Azure, and others. Um, and one of the unique things when you combine that with multi-tenancy is the ability to designate a storage bucket to a tenant. So we can carve up the global namespace and say, this classification of data will go to Amazon, this other classification of data will go to Azure. Uh, so that ability to segment the data across clouds is, um, is truly unique. Um, and, then and when you say class, you're talking about directory structure or you're talking about some metadata associated with the file? Um, so we don't do it at the metadata today. We do it at the, effectively at the directory share filer levels that we can I say this filer is for this type of data set. Um, just to touch on compliance a little bit, and you mentioned the multiple copies of data. Um, we do leverage the cross-region redundant buckets or the geo-redundant buckets from Azure or Amazon, the respective solutions, to provide enterprise companies with two copies across East and West um, with different uh, uh, storage accounts. Um, so this provides them with that, you know, uh, you know, region-wide uh, redundancy if, if something happens. Thank you. Lina, I have a question about the Edge appliance. So uh, how do you compare the appliance uh, in regarding performance with, uh, you know, um, standard uh, NAS systems? I, th I think, you know, when, you when the data is in the cache, basically you get the maximum performance that you would get from the storage device. And because we're software, you can run us on any, uh, you know, depends on what flash, you know, what flash you bought, right? So you, uh, if you buy a more expensive hardware, you're going to get, uh, uh, you know, the, the performance, uh, the maximum performance that the, the hardware, the server provides, because basically we're serving the data locally. Okay? The question is what happens when you, you get out of the cache, you know? So that's, that's where you get a performance penalty because you know we're starting fetching data from the cloud, right? So the question is, so the question is how often does that, does that happen? Now our algorithm is very, very smart. So we say that 90, you know, 9 point, 90 point something uh, at the time, you, don't, you never hit outside of the, the cache, but sometimes it does happen depending on the use case, right? So for that, we actually have the ability to provision very large cache systems. Typically, other gateways in the industry go to around 20, 30 terabyte cache size. We go up to 128 terabyte. And we also give you the option to do pinning of certain folders. So if you know you're going to work on a certain share in a given time, you can pin it locally and you make sure that it's not cached out. 
and therefore you would get really the maximum performance uh, of your storage system. Question Please. about uh, virus scanning. Is that performed on the portal NGHs or how do you handle that? So that's a very good question. We actually do virus scanning. We are the only one to do it this way. We actually do have multi-layer virus scanning. So we have on access filtering on, on the gateway level and we have in cloud scanning for viruses in the, in the portal or in the cloud. What it allows you to do is also to block viruses immediately when they're trying to penetrate or get out. But at the same time, if let's say a signature was updated later on, you can catch it in the background uh, scan without having to download all the data, data to the gateway because the, not all the data is there. It's actually in the cloud. And, and when you look at this architecture, data is syndicated or can be syndicated from any location. So the ability to do scanning both at the edge and the core helps us minimize, you know, the opportunity of viruses actually, uh, uh, you know, traveling your network. Another thing you gain with this architecture is basically built-in backup and DR. Typically, if you had, if this, if we were drawing up here a NAS system uh, uh, for, uh, you know, for a site, you would also need to provision a backup system, right, to backup the NAS. Here in this case, basically, it has built-in backup. You don't need another backup system to backup your, your environment, your data. The, the, the gateway has built-in snapshotting, so everything, you can roll back any file. Let's say you had a, we have customers that get ransomware attacks. With, if they're using our technology, they just roll back to the, to the latest uh, healthy version and they're back and back and running. We, um, we also can do DR, local DR. So let's say you can provision two edge filers, and if the, if the filer is down, you just spin up, a, or you already have it ready, another filer, and the data would, and users would automatically migrate to the other filer, and all the data would be, the cache would be populated, and they can keep using the system as is. And let's say the whole site is down, lost uh, flood, the loss of uh, power, you can still have cloud DR. Why? Because as I said, mentioned earlier, because of the two-tier architecture, we have data presentation also on the portal, on the cloud side. So even if the entire site is down, or let's say there's a pandemic came from nowhere and people need, cannot even access the office, you can still access your data directly to the cloud with any web browser or using our endpoint clients, or you can just spin up another uh, filer you know, on another site or inside the cloud connected to the to the, to the cloud drive and you start populating it with data. So it's really the most complete solution for data access at all time, security, uh, 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 scanning. Um, yep, yep. So is the portal high available? Or yes. you know, is, it, is it dual redundant, that sort of thing? Or can you yes. have multiple portals running in the yes. system? Yes, the, the, and Aaron is going to go into more detail than that, that in his presentation, but the portal is definitely highly available and you can also geo-distribute it for maximum. Uh, and, and, the, and the metadata data. you mentioned was the only block storage that you required. Is, is that uh, also, is that associated with the portal instances? Yes. Is that how it would work? Yes. And it's replicated yes. across the portals. Yes, it's replicated and Aaron will uh, cover that in his presentation. You mentioned that backup is uh, snapshots. Uh, how often is it possible to take the snapshots? Yeah, the system dynamically creates a snapshot almost every few minutes, and you can set the policy uh, of, uh, uh, of the retention, and it's basically customizable. So our users, because they bring their own cloud, you know, having more snapshots costs you more storage, right? But it's bring your own cloud, right? So users, they can define more snapshots and then they will have more granularity of versioning on their system. I want, I want to add another point here. You mentioned about the um, duration of snapshot. No, the sync is almost immediate in our solution. So there's some other solution that maybe sometimes take like 15 minutes to, to refresh or to sync. In our solution, every change is immediately triggers a synchronization event and the sync is happen, happening online. It's not waiting for, let's say, 20 minutes, something like that, for a snapshot to happen. It's constant. Every file that changes gets synced right away. Let's take it to the next level. So we talked about one site, what the building block of a single filer to the cloud and what you gain from that. Now let's replicate that. Let's think of an environment where you have two, five, ten, hundred sites. 
Okay, here in this in this diagram, you see London and New York. Okay, for the distance distance locations, each one of them have, has a filer, and they're working on the same data set. One is uploading a file, the other one needs to see it right away on the other side, and they're working together. Now let's add another layer of complexity. Let's add maybe a thousand users that are roaming users working from home on on the road. Each one of them has a laptop, a drive, a mobile device, and they're accessing the same data. Now let's think of external users, okay? Customers, partners that need to have limited access to parts of the data. Now let's think of upload systems. Maybe it's video systems or logging system or servers for machines that need to upload data into the, this, this, this file system as well. All of that needs to work at the same time. And the core, as you see, is the global file system. It's not the filers. The filers are just a way to access the data in the cloud. So everyone is working directly to the cloud and they're working on the same namespaces and all the data is synchronized between all of them. So that's multi-site collaboration. And we do also, but when it becomes even bigger, you start saying, okay, maybe I want to segment that. Maybe I don't want everyone accessing everything. Even an IT admin can make a, can make a mistake, you know, and, and open access that he's not supposed to. So can I have, so customers are saying, can I have sub-segmentation of that? And for that, we have a feature called zones, where basically we can take global deployment and say, this is Europe, this is North America, this is marketing, this is external users. And we can group different gateways, users, folders together, and make sure that even that, that data can never even get out of one of these networks, but still give the global admin the, the ability to manage everyone and control everything. So that is basically the, what we call the multi-site collaboration use case of bi-directional synchronization between many sites and users. And in the last year, this has evolved more, more, more rapidly also in what we call the remote workforce. So in the previous example, you saw there were some remote users, but in 2020, I don't need to tell you what happened in the world, you know, social distancing led to data distancing. And suddenly not 20, 30%, but 90% or sometimes 100% of users had to work from home. So how do you do that? How do you scale your VDI environments from 20% to 90%. How do you enable users to access corporate NAS data? I'm not talking about OneDrive, you know, here open a OneDrive and put your files. I'm talking about a large NAS system that was sitting with permissions at the headquarters that people were used to accessing over SMB NFS. And now they need to be able to access from remote. Try doing SMB over VPN, over WAN, in a remote high latency location and tell me how is the experience compared to what you were used to at the office. That created a challenge and, and we saw a big uptick in our remote workforce solutions that starts with the agent that I mentioned earlier, but we also released a new version of our filer called HC100. This was actually released with it this year, which is the smaller, smallest edge filer in the industry. It's actually a desktop size, it's a bit like, it's about the size of a smartphone. It has an embedded one terabyte NVMe flash and you can really do amazing workloads. Think of users, professionals working from home, doing a, a, a CAD a users, a media designers, analytics a researchers. And now they have an access of one terabyte cache that can front uh, any size of uh, namespace. And they really get the fast uh, SMB NAS performance even at the home office or a small branch office. So these type of devices and the evolution of our drive software made it really possible for more organization to push the edge of the network into the far edge, into any location, and also at much bigger scale. Again, because of the portal architecture, because of the two-tier architecture, we can basically um, serve thousands of users. And we actually have customers with more than 100,000 users in a single namespace in their own cloud. So that's really uh, the scale that we can get to. And it's also interfaces with Office 365. So you can still do co-editing in Office 365 and uh, send link invitation to files and, and use Outlook plugins and everything you would expect from a corporate uh, content sharing solution. Okay, so let's move to the next use case. And we talked about uh, collaboration and multi-site, but let's talk about edge data processing. We saw how many, um, uh, we saw about, uh, 
we saw how uh, the industry is predicting much more, much more uh, uh, workload placement at the edge. And that has to do with lots of machine generated data, devices, IoT, cars, cameras that generating huge amounts of data that needs to be analyzed at the edge. Sending everything to the cloud is not practical and probably very, very expensive. Many times you can reduce 95% or 99% of the data if you did some uh, local processing of data. But for that, you need both compute and storage together at the same side. So you can have two systems, but there's a, there's a standard in the industry now for that called hyperconverge, right? So we basically created an integrated hyperconverged filer. So we call it the X series. It's based on the HP SimpliVity. But basically, this concept is not just limited to HP. We also work with, we're certified solution on Nutanix, VxRail, Hyperflex, and you can run us as VM on any HCI system. The idea is that it's really what we tried to message to the world with the X series that you can really create a branch in the box for many tier one application VDIs where you can have the, the, the capabilities of HCI, which is strong on, on block, compute, replication, flash usage, right? But HCI is not so strong with file management, not in, in hybrid cloud. This is not the strength point of the HCI solution. So you bolt in Citera on top, and now you get basically unlimited namespace and cloud uh, and transparent cloud, the hybrid cloud uh, storage. So use the, the HCI for the synchronous replication and use Citera for the asynchronous replication. And you get the best of both worlds. VxRail and vSAN ready nodes and that sort of thing use vSAN for the storage. How is Centera integrated in that sort of a, if it's a VxRail appliance, let's say? So basically we use uh, the storage on the X series, on the, on the VxRail for hosting, for storing the cache. Okay. We run Citera as a virtual machine on the VxRail. I see. The storage, the cache is stored on the, v, on the vSAN of the VxRail, but it's presenting a file system which is totally elastic and unlimited in size because our software dynamically moves data between the local cache and the cloud of your choice. I got you. Thanks. So now let's move to media. Media is another great use case for our technology. Media users are typically have a need for storing very large files. And as I mentioned earlier, we have support unlimited file size. Um, they also need, uh, a, think of use cases like 8K video rendering, okay? Photo editing, video editing. For all of that, you need massive amounts of data that usually traditionally were hosted in large local servers, but that's also very expensive, right? So the hybrid solution is the perfect approach for that, but you need really, what you need really is a large cache. And for that, we have architected a device that's using 128 terabyte of hybrid SSD SaaS local cache. And we also added software features that accelerate replication of large media files to the cloud and provide very advanced macOS and Adobe Suite support. So, so and then we have really many Example of examples of customers in the media space using this uh, public user, public customers, reference customers that are using this solution in a very, a very, uh, very neat way. So, Loren, um, question particularly on that with the the particularly media, um, the file because it's physical hardware lives on site. The size of the active working set that people are collaborating on seems like the thing that would be critical here because once things are pushed off into the cloud, if they're not accessed, I don't mind so much. Um, how do you give guidance to customers on sizing of the filers and how flexible is it, is it if we change what, let's say we win a, a, whole, a bunch of new deals and we now need to do a lot more work locally how do we scale that edge filer to match what we're doing? So, so it's a great question. Thank you for that. So there's, first of all, 128 is already, as I mentioned, most of the other solutions in this space typically get capped at 120, 30, and 128 is already the, the largest you can get, okay, in this space. But so, by the fact that you can start with 128 gives you very much room for growth inside that gateway. But if you need, you can obviously add more gateways, as we saw in the multi-site uh, 
uh, scenario or use case, you can also place multiple gateways in the same office, right? They will not necessarily have the same uh, uh, physical cache share, right? But they'll be basically same on, on the same namespace. So you can just place more, more devices uh, on, on your network. If you have more uh, edge filers, uh, there's a possibility that each filer caches the same object. That's a waste of space, I would say. Uh, what you would do in this uh, environment is you probably want to uh, define certain workloads that would be synced to each one of them in order to avoid the extra use of storage and the cache. So we'd say this team would work on this filer and that team would work on this filer. Um, maybe I'll add just from my experience, Justin, you know, from what I've seen working with creative companies uh, uh, that are leveraging this configuration. One is, you know, the physical characteristics of this, this is um, a shared storage array that gets uh, 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 fiber channel connections onto the servers, right? So there's high availability there in terms of the compute, but the storage array can be expanded in case you need more capacity locally, as in, in your example, to... Uh, to service more more acquisition new new, new customers. Um, second thing I saw from just working with, with those creative companies is that there's a pr procedure in place where there's the uh, working data set where they're actively editing, creating new versions of, of their commercials or, or videos or assets. But then uh, there's a there's a there's a folder for the final copy, right? Uh, for a completed job, uh, and that basically triggers the archival or or you know having to that you can reclaim that capacity locally. Um, so with that type of approach, we can deploy a configuration where the working data set is always locally available. And then as you move it out to the archive folder, and then it gets shipped out to the cloud. And as soon as it gets fully replicated, it's uh, evicted from the local cache. And then you realize that capacity again for new projects. So you can set policies at the folder level for both at presence and non-presence. It's the reverse of the pinning operation you talked about earlier. Exactly, exactly. So we can have that at the folder level and this, this uh, actually we call this subfolder level. We can be as granular as uh, configuring the subdirectories in your folder in your folder tree uh, of the ones you want to have local and cloud. Um, so um, yeah, so, so this is kind of, I will say a repeating pattern I see in the media space. Some of what I was getting at there is, is around that operational management of things it, and how that aligns with what the actual business use of this system is, right? Because particularly in these sorts of areas, it's not a centralized IT management thing where you've got an IT person generally who's managing that. I I kind of want Satera. I, I want to understand what Satera brings to that, um, so that it, figuring out if this is sort of a hybrid mul, um, managed service cloud offering. Got it. Uh, so, as far as so, I guess if you could clarify, is as far as the delivery of this. So, um, on the... so, so it sounds like yes, you've you've thought of a lot of these things, and it does um, align with my workflow, as as you mentioned mm -hmm. with the media side of things. There, um, for for something like I'm expanding the amount of storage I need because I need more of it. Is that a customer responsibility, or is Satera able to to more or less handle that for me? Yes. So from a, yes, on the back end side, we can provide um, as, as part of purchasing, for example, this unit or other units. And we provide also that, um, you know, processes behind it of sending someone on site to if we need to add a drive or, uh, you know, add another server. And then we will take care of expanding that uh, logical volume to, to present more capacity. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so this will not be a responsibility of yeah. the customer. Yeah. Maybe we'll cover that a bit more in the next session about the commercial approach, because uh, we do have maybe I would say two types of customers. One is where they basically bring you on cloud. They want to control it. They run the portal and they want to have full control of what they do with it. In that case, they are the one that making these the central decisions. And then we have a second type of customers that basically are more subscribing to it as a service. Okay. In this case, I think it's more where they expect us to help them with that. Okay. Um, I have another question about, about the, the appliance. So what happens if there is a major failure of the hardware? Do you have any uh, mechanism to repopulate the cache so that when people comes back to the office, they are ready to work at full speed? Yes, um, we have a mechanism of a patch, a cache. Uh, let's say you, we call it fast DR. Uh, basically, you set up another gateway or and then it automatically starts uh, prefetching data 
Uh, so you have the data ready for the users when they come to the office. Okay. And, and we also have the ability to, uh, to use it. We have a tool that allows you to pre-warm the cache based on uh, the access time. So uh, files that were accessed uh, recently, you can uh, pre-fetch them, let's say at the night before you uh, uh, move to the new device and then you have a warm cache the next morning. Uh, just to add to that, so uh, just a couple of things. As soon as we attach a filer, a brand new filer onto the global file system, we then start populating all the metadata. That is, that is happening very quick because the metadata is very light. Um, there's also prioritization and how that metadata gets populated. So most recent data sets that were created will be populated first. Um, and then on top of that, as Aaron mentioned, we can hydrate and say, I want the last 90 days, last year, to also have the block data before I ship that filer onto its destination site. And then th this ensures that your cache hit rate will be, will be very high as you, as you swap those appliances. But the fact that the metadata is available right away means that users can keep working. Um, so we minimize by a lot the time it takes to you to, to fail over, right? So, so this highly available access is really what you is the fundamental aspect of, of the global file system is that not only you can rebuild it very quick, but also the fact that you can have a, an HA pair, a warm standby that's deployed in a hosting center in a cloud provider that is already presenting those same shares, you can keep working. But what if you don't have a hot standby? Um, so and, have and that's fine. And that's fine. We would then provide uh, we, we would then provide, uh, as we said, uh, an, uh, an automated controls for you to rebuild that filer with the same identity as the one that just failed. Okay. So we, can, um, we, we, we continuously back up the identity and the configuration of that filer um, so we can import it onto a new one and then it starts populating all that data back. Right, thank you. Let's move to the last, uh, last use case, uh, and that's uh, container native file services. We touched about on that a bit uh, earlier. That's something that uh, we are, we will be releasing uh, later uh, this year. And the idea is basically to provide access to the file system directly from a Kubernetes cluster, okay? And the, the nice thing about it is it basically can do multi-cluster, right? Because we provide ability to access a uh, share from different uh, locations and different, uh, geographic locations, you can basically do multi-cluster, multi-geo, uh, POSIX file access uh, for Kubernetes applications as a file mount. So we'll mount it and all the pods in the node will be able to access the data. And you get all the benefits of the architecture that we talked about before. So this uh, now, you know, there are many solutions in the storage space and the hybrid uh, file storage space. Um, I really want to highlight where we see as Citera uh, the uniqueness of our solution, where we find that we can do things that others are not doing in the same way and uh, where we are relevant for customers and which features are, <laughs> are more relevant for customers that are looking for, for Citera or find Citera useful for them. Um, so there's, there's a long list, but this is uh, the short table, I would say. Okay. And uh, we, we chose to basically compare it to NAS which is the traditional file storage approach has been here for 30, 40 years, and to cloud gateways, which is basically a set of other uh, vendors in this space that provide the basically hybrid uh, caching gateways. Um, so let's start with SMBNFS. SMBNFS is the basic functionality you would expect from any type of this system, and we all support it. So that's the, that's the baseline. When we go into performance, you start seeing differences. NAS is obviously you can buy the, the performance that you can afford. Um, and relative to other gateways, to other gateway technologies, we find our solution to be between three to 10 times faster. And that's uh, really the, because of our Citera Direct protocol, the, the, the high performance protocol that we've released uh, last year, as well as the ability to really configure very large cache size. So we can meet uh, local, really achieve local NAS performance in many, many of the use cases, most of the use cases. So that's uh, the, the second element. The third is security. Now, as I mentioned, we came from the security space. Security is close to our heart. And everything we've done in this company is really to create the most uh, secure solution in our space. Arne is gonna talk about it a bit more, but we have what we call zero trust, where basically 
even if one site is compromised, it cannot take down the whole system. Uh, we have support private dark sites, military grade uh, dark sites of 100% private cloud where none of our employees can even touch the system. And we are the only solution in our space that's actually DISA APL certified. So we are military grade certified and that's really a strong statement. In terms of collaboration, I mentioned, I reviewed it earlier in some of the use cases. We are the only one that do both gateway, endpoint, mobile, web, and that's because of our two-tier architecture that allows us to do that. We support native object. This is something that the other gateways do as well. Basically, the golden copy is the object, and the gateway is just the cached uh, shadow of the master copy. And NAS typically is not that. You can run on tap in the cloud, but basically you need to provision a block device and run your NAS on it. And maybe you can do some tiering uh, to the object, but to the object, but the master copy is on, you need to have a block volume for that. And that leads to the next element, which is caching. So we do caching. Traditional NAS doesn't, know, doesn't do caching. In some cases do, does tiering, but caching and tiering is very different technologies and, uh, and RM is gonna touch on that. Um, we do a uh, geo distribution, basically leveraging the ability of object to be available anywhere uh, across the world. We support multi-cloud and when we say multi-cloud, we just don't just mean that we support integrating with different cloud providers. It means that we can do private, public, hybrid and concurrent. Uh, you had, there were some questions about that earlier, but we can basically load balance workloads between uh, between different cloud infrastructures based on, the, on, on different uh, predefined policies. And we are much, we, we support large scale. We talked how the traditional approaches really typically when do, we do small number of sites, it works. You go to the small tens of sites, it starts breaking. And the high tens or the hundreds, it's impractical. In our cases, we have proven deployments of thousands of sites 100,000 users on the same namespace, and it's really something that we really excel on. So this, if you want to say, is a short list of why we think we're different. And if that's relevant to any uh, customer who's listening or to any uh, prospect, then we believe we have the best solution to address these, uh, these challenges. And that uh, basically completes uh, my presentation for today. Uh, this is Citera, your files, your cloud. We believe we provide the best of file with the best of cloud. The widest use case coverage uh, from a single platform, the best choice of cloud with basically any cloud provider, 36 cloud providers. We provide the top performance. Our cloud sync protocol can sync 30 terabytes a day of incremental change. Okay, And add to that the DDoop and other technologies that we have, and you can see that you can really handle massive data sets. We support up to 128 local cache for really on always local experience for the data sets you're working on right now. The top security with the certification, all the different levels of security, the scale that we talked about and the control. And we're gonna show you more demos of that later on, but we have tools for migrating data for data insight and for automation DevOps SDK.